New Brick. Bricks to build your dream on. Bricks in the same mould as Australia's early days. The New Brick Settlers Range. Earthy rich colours fired in kilns to these blends. The New Brick Settlers Range. Pioneer bricks from New Brick. Around the world, terracotta roofing tiles have stood the test of time. New Brick. Terracotta roofing tiles come in so many permanent colours and good-looking shapes. No rust, no fading, no painting. Just good, rich terracotta colours. Time-tested New Brick terracotta roofing tiles. a great year for the Essendon Football Club, not least of all for the fact that the Bombers, one of the most popular VFL clubs, had had a revival that saw them take out the flag. The Bombers' record now stands at 13 premierships, equal with Collingwood, second only to Carlton, which has 14. Yes, the Blues, 14. The 1984 premiership success gave a new generation of Essendon supporters for the first time that unforgettable feeling standing at the MCG with your heart thumping, your eyes watering, and that very big lump in the throat as they cheered their team to victory. Now, all the supporters, and of course, <laughs> I'm definitely one of those, have experienced it all before. Many of those who attended the inaugural meeting at Robert McCracken's home were drawn from horse racing and farming families. Names such as W.S. Cox of Mooney Valley Racing Club fame and Dalgetty and young husband of Woolbroking fame were present. In the early days, the Essendon home games were played at McCracken's Paddock, now Mercy College, opposite the tram depot in Mount Alexander Road, Flemington. Well, it didn't take long for Essendon to make its mark as a club and when the Victorian Football Association was formed in 1877, Essendon was there. By 1882, the club had moved its headquarters from Flemington to the East Melbourne Cricket Ground, where there were better facilities. The new ground was near Jollymont Road and Wellington Parade, now taken over by the Jollymont Railway Yards. There was considerable feeling at the time that Essendon should have moved to the Essendon Recreation Reserve. The club, in fact, applied to use the ground that was to belatedly become their home in 1922, but they were turned down on the casting vote of the mayor. As well as a new ground, Essendon had a new uniform. The early colours had been red and black stripes, but now the footballers wore a black jersey with a red sash coming over the left shoulder and red and black hose. It had been the McCracken family who had a profound influence on the early development of the Essendon Football Club. Alex McCracken was the club's first secretary. He later became president. And when the Victorian Football League was later founded, Alex McCracken was the league's first president. Some of the outstanding players? 
Captain, Alec Dick, champion fullback, net officer, the man who's reputed to have introduced high marking into Australian football. Charles Pearson, champion ruckman, Charles Tracker Forbes, there's a name, and rover George Vorton. Pearson, Forbes and Vorton were all champions of the colony during this time. This was the equivalent of winning a Brownlow medal. But there was one man who was head and shoulders above the others. Albert Thurgood was the first of the Essendon legends. Thurgood joined the club in 1892 and he took the football world by storm in his first year as the great John Coleman was to do 57 years later. He headed the association goal kicking list and during his career was champion of the colony on three occasions. Thurgood was in Western Australia when Essendon and seven other clubs crossed over to join the Victorian Football League in 1897. He was not there when Essendon had the distinction of winning the first league premiership. To win the flag, Essendon had to defeat Melbourne. And in a great spectacle, the final score, Essendon, one goal, eight behinds. Melbourne, eight behinds. This score is still the lowest score ever recorded in a finals match. The team was brilliantly led by George Stuckey and he was ably supported by Todd Collins. Four years later, Albert Thurgood was back from the West and almost single-handedly pulled off the 1901 Premiership for his team in an amazing individual performance. After two Premierships in four years, there was a 10-year Premiership drought at the club. But the drought was finally broken with a vengeance, with back-to-back -back Premierships in 1911 and 1912. Eston was undoubtedly the new kings of the league at this time. In the lead-up, Eston had appointed John Worrell as coach. He'd been a dynamic coach at Carlton and taken that club to three premierships. Worrell's very name was magic in league circles. During these premiership years, Eston had some great champions. Players like Dave Smith, who was 1911 captain, Alan Belcher, the 1912 captain, Ernie Cameron, Bill Brusbridge, Billy Stewart, and Fred Baring. In the first minutes of the game, Essendon lost brilliant wingman Fred O'Shea, and then in the dying stages, outstanding rover Ernie Cameron was out of action. There were no reserves at this time, so, with two men short, Essendon's victory by four points must still be one of the greatest performances ever put up by the club. The joy of winning two premierships in a row didn't stop the club slumping the next year, and it took another 11 years to recover from the downturn. Essendon, like many other clubs, dropped out of the league in 1916 and 1917 in support of the war effort. But with players such as Percy Ogden, who captained the club during this period, there was a gradual turnaround in performance. In 1922, Essendon took over its present ground in Napier Street, Essendon. It had taken just over 50 years for the club to establish itself at its present headquarters. Before long, supporters were referring to their teams as the Bombers. And before this, they were called the same old, a derivation from the words of a song that supporters chanted in English soccer style from the old grandstand at the East Melbourne ground. The move to Essendon heralded another successful period in the history of the club. Essendon revolutionised league football with a team of midgets who became known as the Mosquito Fleet. The distinct feature of this star-studded group clearly was the number of players who averaged a height of 5 foot 5 inches or 156 centimetres in modern pilots. Key players were Charlie Hardy, Rowley Watt, George Shorten, Vince Owen, and Frank Ma. It was the turn of the little men to take over and to start a new fashion. Selectors of other clubs were thrown into confusion. By 1923, there was another premiership side at Essendon. The grand final win against Fitzroy by 17 points was a triumph for the team of mighty midgets. And to emulate the feat of 1911 and 1912, Essendon again won back-to-back -back flags. But the cost of the 1924 flag was high. 
Having reached the finals, Essendon had to fight for the flag through a new system of six finals. The Premier team was to be the club that had the highest percentage at the conclusion of these games. In this ridiculous situation, Essendon were easily beaten in their last game by Richmond, but they still won the Premiership. If Essendon supporters were shocked by the performance of the team on the playing field, they were completely shattered by what took place in the Essendon dressing rooms and at the club dinner afterwards. As supporters, we were very upset to learn that fighting took place among our own players at the function that was held after the match. It appeared that they blamed each other for the very bad uh, performance that they carried out on the field and to make the situation even worse, the whole thing was repeated the following week when Essendon played a charity match against Footscray to decide who would be the championship football team, either the association or the, the league leaders. On this occasion, Essendon played even worse and the arguments and dissatisfaction that took place following this match caused a leading player and the player of the year, Tom Fitzmorris, to get out, up and walk from the room and never return to play for Essendon again. He transferred to Geelong where he performed for them the following year. After the events of 1924, the club lost its well-balanced and blended team. It was a tragedy for Frank Reed, who served 29 years as club secretary, that even he could not dispel the unrest during this black period for the club. During the late 20s, Essendon stayed around the middle of the premiership list, slumping to wooden spooners in 1933. A player who observed, if I can use that word, this fall, was top half forward and centre man, Howard Oakey. In 1928, when I joined Essendon, the club was a very low ebb. And during the next few years, in 1933, we finished up second bottom on the list. And I uh, retired in 1934. It must have been exasperating for the likes of Frank Maher, Garnet Campbell, Norm Beckton, Keith Forbes and Len Webster who had captained the team during the period. The wages were three pound per week. That was early in the season. If we were going bad it was reduced to 30 shillings per week. As a matter of fact I played over a over hundred odd games and I finished up getting a uh, 15 pound out the Provident Fund. That's, I don't know what happens these days. That's in contrast to what they get now. <laughs> Ten years after Oakey's retirement, he joined the Essendon Football Club Committee and served there for nearly 30 years. Despite the club hitting rock bottom in 1933, they secured the services of a player who was to become their second legend. His name was Dick Reynolds. Dick Reynolds uh, joined the club in 1933 and uh, oh, he showed excellent uh, ability as a matter of fact. and. Uh, uh, in 1934, he was good enough to win the Brownlow medal, so it shows how good he was. By 1939, Reynolds had won three Brownlow medals and had become captain coach of the club at the age of 25. In 1939, uh, uh, Jack Baggett was sacked as coach and the uh, committee uh, put the proposition to me to be uh, joint coach with Harry Hunter and we finished out the rest of the year as uh, joint captain and coaches. Uh, I took over in 1940 and from there onwards, well, I've, uh, I look back on my, my uh, career or history with the club and I feel that uh, it was just wonderful, although I didn't win enough premierships. King Reynolds was to stay on as captain coach for a mammoth 12 seasons before becoming non-playing coach for another 10 years. He went on to win premierships in 1942, 1946, 49 and 1950. For the five years that Reynolds was captain coach, Essen was never out of the four and the team only missed two grand finals between 1941 and 1951. This was an incredible turnaround for a team that had been in the doldrums for so long. After being beaten in the 1941 grand final by Melbourne, in 1942, there was another premiership flag unfurled at Essendon. 
we went on in 1942, and I thought that was one of our, well, as far as I was, con I was concerned, it was a, a marvellous achievement uh, to win my first grand final and play the club. And, and, and that, although I've won Brownlow medals, I feel that winning winning the uh, premiership in 1942 that was the highlight of my career up to then, anyway. What Dick Reynolds didn't say was that the final score of 1918-132 was the highest score in any finals game to that date. And the King himself was undoubtedly best on the ground. 1946 saw the start of Essendon's rise again to a top league team. In 1946, we won another flag, and, and that's something that I'll never, never forget in my memory. The third quarter, I think we kicked about 11 goals, and... Uh, we won that very convincingly, and uh, after the game, I can always remember somebody said to me, what happened today? I says, well, I was out there today, and the fellas I was in a shopping rush. The Eastern players were in a shopping rush. They were running for goals, and it was just like a mad shopping rush for goals. And uh, we won it easily, and that stuck out in my mind. That, uh, it was unbelievable to win like we did that day. Essendon won three great premierships in 1946, 1949 and 1950. They are in six grand finals in succession and could, with a bit of luck, have created a new record of six flags in a row. In 1947, we played Carlton in the grand final and, uh, and I can even remember Stafford kicked, kicked that goal and to my mind it could have been even a point of, or a, a goal and anyway, they gave it a goal. The goal umpire gave it a goal and we lost by one point. The 1948 grand final was amazing. I'll never forget it. We kicked 727 and we drew with Melbourne. We did everything but kick goals that day. And, uh, well, in the replay, it turned out we, uh, we just run out of legs or something and we weren't a patch on ourselves the week before. In the annual report to members for the 1948 season, Secretary Bill Cookson said that notwithstanding the excellent show, it's very apparent that no team is complete without a spearhead. 1949 saw John Coleman arrive on the football scene. Yes, those that had only heard of the grateful forwards of the past at last gained an insight into just how good these old timers were. But as good as they were, not one of the former stars hit the public with quite the same impact as the Essendon champion. Coleman amazed the football world by kicking 12 goals in his first match against Hawthorne and he became the first player in history to score 100 goals and had the lead goal kicking in his first year in league football. The 73 point victory over Carlton was a record winning margin in a grand final and the great Coleman kicked his 100th goal during the match. Hundreds of people had spilled over the fence to sit on the boundary line inside the oval and he was cheered off the ground by ecstatic Essendon supporters. In 1950, the Dons continued to play brilliant football to win 19 out of their 20 home and away matches. They were brilliant in attack with men like Bill Snell and, of course, John Coleman. As well, they were strong and safe in defence with the likes of Bill Brittingham, Roy McConnell, Norm MacDonald, Twinkle Toes we used to call him, and a great centre man and half-back flanker in Harold Lambert. They had top ruckmen in Bluey McClure and Chooka May and excellent rovers in Dick Reynolds, of course, and Bill Hutchison. They thrashed side after side as they swept through the season. Essendon were head and shoulders above the rest of the sides in the competition. They had the most complete side fielded since the war. It was a great triumph for Dick Reynolds, who after playing for 17 years, had decided that this was to be his last season as a player. In his first year as non-playing coach at Essendon, Reynolds nearly pulled off another premiership in 1951. John Coleman in the last game of the year was suspended for striking Casper and uh, it's one of the uh, things that, well, uh, it's the biggest headache I can ever remember. I walked into the room at half time and John was half dressed, in fact three quarter dressed and on his way out and home. And I had to shut the door, I had to keep everybody out the room and it took me about ten minutes to, to dress. In fact, I think I remember helping to put his Guernsey on and everything and put his boots on and to finish. And I was told him he had to go out there on the ground, he had to show Carlton and the Casper and everybody, you know, that he was 
he was still a force. And there's no doubt he went out in that second half and he won the game for us against Carlton. Unfortunately, we never had him in the grand final. If he'd been in the grand final, there's no doubt about it, we would have beaten Geelong fairly easy that day. That's my opinion. The club went through a lean period. And on the first Saturday in June 1954, Essendon supporters were stunned when champion full forward John Coleman crashed to the ground after taking a mark against North Melbourne. The disastrous knee injury sustained at the age of 25 was to prevent him from playing football for Essendon ever again. In five and a half years of senior football, his tally was 537 goals, and he headed the league's goal-kicking list on four occasions. His average was over five goals in every match. One name to feature among the best in the 1946 Premiership win was a young man called Bill Hutchison, who made his debut with Essendon earlier in the year. Hutchie became captain five years later, and the champion Little Rover won the Brownlow medal in 1953 at the incredible age of 30. In 1957, Bill Hutchison retired, having played in a record 30 state sides. Hutchie represented Victoria in every year, from 1946 to 1953, and was twice captain. Towards the end of the 50s, the club began to improve its position. With the help of players like John Gill, Jeff Leake and Hugh Mitchell, Essendon featured in the grand final in both 1957 and 1959. By 1961, John Coleman had returned to the club as coach, with Bill Hutchison as his deputy. The Dons had become known as the gliders in the latter part of Dick Reynolds' reign, and it was decided that steps had to be taken to improve the overall performance of the team. But even the most optimistic Essendon supporters didn't expect a premiership by 1962. Champion centre-half forward Ken Fraser won his fourth year at Essendon at the time. It was uh, quite refreshing in some ways to us as players to have a new coach. Um, John Coleman had a, a different approach to coaching. He demanded more from us. He was uh, willing to make more changes. He asked us to be a bit more aggressive, and I think we were. We responded to the challenges he, uh, he gave to us. And uh, 1962 was a magnificent year for the club. We ended up uh, on top of the ladder at the, uh, the end of the home and home series, and then uh, went on to play Carlton in the grand final and uh, had a magnificent match against Carlton. It, Highlighted, I think, by the brilliance of our small men, Jack Clark, who was captain of the side, a magnificently clever player, courageous, and he led the, the club superbly in that grand final. John Burt, another small player, one of our Rovers, again played a magnificent game to set up uh, so many winning moves. We had a very strong half-back line and, uh, and we were just too strong for Carlton that, that day. Uh, three years later, I was fortunate enough to... Uh, be made captain of the club in 1965 when Jack Clark retired as captain. And uh, fortunately again, we, uh, we managed to just get into the, the final series. We uh, ended up in third spot and then played uh, from um, the first semi-final and had a good win there, had a good win in, in uh, the preliminary final against Collingwood. And then in the grand final against St Kilda, who'd never won a, a grand final and who uh, were very anxious to win that grand final for the first time ever, we again played a magnificent match and uh, were far too strong. And it was uh, certainly the highlight of my career to um, hold up the Premiership Club on Essendon Club, Football Club's behalf in front of 100,000 people at the MCG. As the 60s moved on, the players who'd led the club throughout the Premiership years moved into the veteran stage. And by 1968, John Coleman had stood down as coach to be replaced by the recently retired star, Jack Clark. And Clark got the Bombers into the grand final in his first year. The Dons went down by only three points to Carlton, and an injury that put skipper Ken Fraser out of the grand final side could have cost the club a flag. The 1970s were mediocre years, Fresnan. The decade got away to a bad start when a group of five players, Captain Don McKenzie, Barry Davis, Jeff Pryor, Daryl Gerlach and Jeff Gosper, all decided to strike over match payments. The club threatened to split wide open before the row was settled. In 1969, 
uh, following the grand final appearance in 68, uh, we thought that we were in for a good season. But five of us uh, thought that the unfairness to Rule 11, as far as the VFL was concerned, we tried to improve the situation as far as pay employment was concerned. Uh, we did go on strike, but still wanted to play football with Essendon. Uh, then we moved into the 70s. Uh, a number of coaches uh, were tried, uh, namely uh, John Burt, Des Tudnam, Bill Stevens, and Barry Davis. Uh, John's uh, one year of, of uh, coaching had many problems, uh, possibly the disciplining of players in that particular year was a very hard job for uh, John. Des Tudden came uh, in, in 72 and uh, was an excellent coach in as much as that we uh, did make the finals in 72 and 73. But then when injuries started to hit him, he found it very, very difficult to coach from the sidelines and uh, not being able to coach by example, he also uh, uh, found it very, very difficult. Bill Stevens came along in uh, 76 and 77 and groomed a number of players uh, for the Essendon Football Club who are still playing now, namely Nagel, Watson, Hurd and Van der Haar. He saw the potential of these chaps. Barry Davis, an excellent player, uh, but also found it very, very difficult uh, in the coaching field. In 76, of course, uh, uh, possibly one of the highlights as far as the decade was concerned, Graham Moss uh, was captain of the side in, in 76 and was fortunate enough to win the Brownlow medal. 1981, a transformation occurred at Essendon. There was a new administration and a new coach. Kevin Sheedy burst onto the football scene with a vengeance. Well, 1981 is a, a, my start of a, a career at uh, coaching and uh, messing it over the 70s and the late 70s in particular had uh, been quite a potential sort of team. They had some good players in the team and uh, I felt that um, if I could get the job as coach I, I felt that there was a, a rate of improvement that I could uh, get out of the boys and um, 1981 we, we had quite a good year and uh, we unfortunately dropped from out of the top three late in the season. We won 18 matches on end at one stint there during the season and we got off to a poor start which was unfortunate but uh, perhaps Neil, losing Neil Danahar was the, the, the worst thing that happened to Essendon in 1981 I would say because 1981 um, was a year where we were hoping to get and do very well in the finals and we lost an elimination final to Fitzroy. I think from the 81 list we had lost about 28 players and we've kept 14 of the players which is a lot of turnover and uh, with Noel Jenkins recruiting and Brian and Donahue, Kevin Egan and myself really working out what sort of philosophy we were going to take and the type of style of game that was needed to win a, a VFL premiership after the club had not done so well for a number of years. We again got to the finals in 82 and um, unfortunately another elimination final lost to, to North Melbourne. 1983 was a year where we sort of uh, got in, won our first final since uh, 1968, just a finals match. And um, that was sort of a breakthrough for the club because it was such a drain losing five elimination finals. And I mean, I remember the people uh, after the elimination final victory, God, I thought, you know, the world had sort of spun around and the club was terribly pleased to get through that uh, game and we progressed through to the grand final against Hawthorne and which was naturally a shattering day for my players and our club and, and for me naturally as a coach. Um, to your first grand final as a coach you're always naturally hoping for the obvious and that's to win but to be beaten badly and uh, to lose by a you know a, a poor margin was uh, a great disappointment for everybody. Any Bomber supporter who was down in the dumps about the 1983 grand final debacle must have been delighted as an extraordinarily committed Essendon side smashed through the Hawthorne defence to kick a record breaking nine goals, six behind in the last quarter to storm away with the flag.
1984 was sort of a good year for us in recruiting and getting the best list of players available at Essendon since the previous Great Essendon signs. To say that 1984 was sort of a good year for Essendon must be the understatement of the year. Because, Bomber supporters, bless you all, there are more great Essendon years to come. More very great years.
really um, a surprise for the coach to come up in the end and got another premiership. Song. And on the tables, for those of you who just might have forgotten the words, are some sheets with the, uh, the words of the song. We think you know it, but why don't we tell all of Melbourne what we think? Come on with the theme song. President of the Esselin Football Club, Greg Sill. Well, thanks very much, uh, Alan, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For some reason or other, I get the distinct impression that tonight is somewhat different to this time last year. Be upstanding and to drink the toast to not only the players that played today, but indeed to every player that's represented Essendon during the season 1984, together with all of the coaching panel and the match committee. A much brighter, happier and cheerful speech to be going to this room at this time last year. Our premiership has ten seasons. Now you're going to have to bear with me a little bit tonight because I've been such a boring person at these sort of functions. <laughs> I know how I can destroy a night very quickly. <laughs> very difficult to be a, uh, an extrovert coach in a conservative community. <laughs> but, uh, I'd like to firstly start off with uh, hoping that everybody uh, enjoys tonight. <laughs> been a very embarrassing 12 months, I can assure you. Um, I suppose the first people that I would like to thank is uh, the players that have played for Essendon this year and the four years that I have been here. The players have done a magnificent job and uh, to come back and play 
a nine goal six last quarter and win the grand final is a fantastic effort. I think that um, amongst the sort of atmosphere that we can um, really enjoy tonight, we, we shouldn't get carried away with ourselves because really... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's amazing, you know, really, I mean, a fair dig when a fisherman goes to really throw, throw that line in, you come in hook, long and sinker every time, don't you? But, um, the players are the, the, the ones that win you the game. Don't ever worry about that. Your players are the players that go out there and get the score on the board and uh, if you win, you win, and you lose, you lose. But I would think that there are some people that I would like to thank for the 1984 season. I would just like to go through it very quickly. I'd like to thank the selectors that have worked very hard with myself. I'd like to thank, which is David Collins and uh, Terry Danaher. <laughs> Kevin Morris, who uh, has been a tremendous assistant. He didn't win the Premiership this year, but we did. Uh, Gary Bryce, John Newman, Ken Fletcher. To me, uh, you know, like the coaching panel is terribly important. Uh, Fred Lehman. And, Peter Power and, and Nick Nefito to get that boxing going is really good, isn't it? Eh? Get a bit of punch in your game every now and then. Um, one of the greatest sort of uh, people that I feel I have met since I've been at Essendon is Jackie Jones, and I like to thank Jackie Jones. For that. Just thanks, Jack, for giving me a bit of a confidence every now and then, pal, you know, like, um, every now and then when the world seems to be against you, you just... <laughs> to our staff, our staff has been uh, wonderful, um, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I mean, working with a, a person like myself, for Kevin Egan, who was, was always on beck and call, a wonderful ever many. Thanks very much. We we'll booked you into the asylum next week, mate. So you can relax. Here. Well, I think Alan says it all. I simply stand, irrespective of what our attitudes are elsewhere, speaking on behalf of supporters. And I say, Kevin, this is the greatest night of the year for us. And thank you. It's probably uh, also the greatest gathering of football talent ever assembled in this hotel since Sheedy was here on his own. <laughs> we wouldn't have said that five years ago, but we may say it for another five or fifty years to come. But I also thank Kevin and the committee and the players and all associated directly with the club on behalf of supporters which cover a range of people tonight, from frankly, the greatest man to ever pull on an Essendon jersey like Dick Reynolds, here tonight. Thanks, Alan. Uh, gee whiz. Uh, it's, uh, hang on, hang on. I'm a better speech maker than that. Uh, no, really, I, it was just a wonderful feeling to, to run off the ground and uh, to realise we've sort of grabbed the Premiership for 84. I think that uh, it hasn't really sunk into a lot of us just yet. It was just a, a tremendous thing to, you know, to fought out for three quarters. I thought S uh, Hawthorne started very well and uh, 
And I guess, you know, full credit to us, we just kept chipping away and uh, working and eventually we, we made it all happen. But uh, a special thank you, know, like I think a special praise must be given to our coach, um, Kevin Sheedy, for uh, he, he's probably, he's done a pretty good job and he's persevered with, uh, <laughs> you can't sort of build him up too high yet. He's going to be with us for a few years to come, just yet. But, uh, but I think that, um, he, he done a real good job and he's persevered with the players that he's had at the club, you know, for uh, the time. For players such as myself, I've been dragged a few times and uh, there have been a few players that have sort of, uh, you know, struggled a bit there for a while, but he's kept, he kept on with them and with the likes of you know, getting Darren Williams back into a cl the club and, uh, rec Yay! and you know, and uh, recruiting players with the likes of Leon Baker and Paul Weston and... Uh, yeah, other players, you know, into the club, they, they've all been bloody tremendous goers to us and uh, they've, certain, they've been really great. But, uh, there's one thing I, you know, before I uh, tune in for the, uh, turn it in for the night, uh, I'd just like to uh, thank, our, thank our number one supporter and that's uh, Mark the Phantom. He's a, he's a guy that, uh, uh, I'll give him a touch. He's, He's a tremendous guy, he turns up there training and uh, he's probably one of the guys responsible for getting us out there and winning. The players really love him and uh, also to our wives, I th you know, I think they've got, they've got to put up with a hell of a lot and they had throughout the year. I guess it's hard, it's a pity we couldn't sort of you know, pick 30 players to run out in the ground today. It's, as Kevin has already mentioned, with guys like um, Steve Carey and um, Tony Bahaja and uh, Paul Simon and uh, my brother Neil and a lot of other players, Cameron Clayton, Renee Kink. You can go right on down through the list. Players have played senior matches. You know, it's a, it, I feel really it, Sorry that we couldn't sort of actually fit them in there somewhere to get out there. I know we, we, we weren't able to do that, but uh, I really uh, feel a lot for those guys. They've been tremendous players for us at the club. And, and uh, to everyone else, to the supporters, on behalf of the players, I thank you very much for sticking behind us, really, and giving, you know, then 84 is our year. And actually, enough, let's kick on. All right? Thank you.
Well, to say that 1984, as far as Essendon is concerned, was a, a sort of great year would probably be the understatement of the year. Because note this, as far as the bombers are concerned, there are many more great years to come. New brick. Bricks to build your dream on. Bricks in the same mould as Australia's early days. The new brick settlers range. Earthy rich colours fired in kilns to these blends. The Newbrick Settlers Range. Pioneer bricks from Newbrick. Around the world, terracotta roofing tiles have stood the test of time. Newbrick terracotta roofing tiles come in so many permanent colours and good looking shapes. No rust, no fading, no painting. Just good, rich terracotta colours. Time-tested new brick terracotta roofing tiles. <laughs>